I'm Matt, I'm Bill Rector. Delighted, sometimes overly delighted, to be the, the teaching pastor here at Highland Country Fellowship. And we're glad you've joined us. It is such a beautiful day, uh, and we are here. And every week, we share this wonderful, fantastic, friendly fellowship with one another. I feel it the minute I walk in here. Thank you for that. Thank you for lending that to me as you share the Spirit of God that reflects off of each of you when we gather together. And we hear this wonderful worship. Uh, and if I could think of more W words, I'd throw them in there. Uh, every, every Sunday, it makes our hearts and our mouth and our mind and our, our souls sing. And now what we do is, is we, we want to hear the teaching, the transformative teaching of God. The timeless and transformative. I'm going to throw another T in there, okay? And that's what we're going to do every week. We open God's Word. We go verse by verse through the Bible. And I'm really excited uh, to teach this to you today. Uh, we're going to be in uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. I'm going to begin in verse 1. And let's just jump right in. Let me read this to you. If you're following along at home, uh, Luke 18, verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord, and the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Beautiful parable. The title of today's sermon is Persistent Prayer. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the artwork for this. Uh, uh, Eugene Bernand was the Swiss artist that painted this originally, and then what you've got here is a, uh, a black and white uh, drawing of it. And uh, uh, Bernand was, uh, lived in the eight, late 1800s and early 1900s. And later in his life, he was inspired to do uh, paintings of all of the parables, the collections of the parables. And I would... Uh, if, you're, uh, if you like art, you will enjoy it. He's a naturalist. And I think if, if you know anything, you could tell by how realistic the faces are in this and, uh, and, and this beautiful artwork. And so this is what, uh, what, what his take on this, this parable that we heard is. And you can kind of see the, the judge to the left there, aloof, maybe not caring so much, the widow making her plea to the right. This is really a fun parable. In some ways, for me, it's very easy because... Uh, it's easy to understand, but it's really hard to apply. Uh, at least it is for me. I'm going to make that confession right now. Uh, so let's dig in if we can, and let's see if we can uh, figure out what Jesus is, is wanting us to apply here. But before I do, I, I want to reach back a few verses, if I can. Towards the end of chapter 17, we started hearing Jesus talk about his return, his second coming. And he used this term to describe himself, which is kind of interesting because Jesus is describing himself almost in third person terms. And he used this term son of man, right? And, and in some ways that's kind of odd for someone to refer to themselves in the third person. But in Jesus' case, it was his favorite term to use to describe himself and really describe the role he was playing in history to say the son of man. And in some ways, it really is such a beautiful theological statement. This is God that wanted so much to identify with you and me that he came to be a person, a son of man. And, and that's, that's part of it. But it also, it's the origins of this term go back to uh, Daniel and Ezekiel. And they really begin, when you hear the term son of man, it often implies an end times prophecy. And so Jesus is using that a lot here from the end of chapter 17, really even through the end of this parable. And I just want to take you through the verses that we've heard, starting in uh, chapter 17, verse 22. Then he said to his disciples, we, we talked about this last week, 
Uh, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. And then verse 24, for the Son of Man in his day will be like lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. And verse 26, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. And verse 30, it will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. And then the one we heard from our selection today towards the very end, the first, or I guess the last part of, of verse 8 in chapter 18. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And, and the reason I'm pointing that out is through this entire set of teaching that began towards the end of chapter 17 and includes this parable, we get kind of a Son of Man sandwich here, all right? I hope that isn't too irreverent. But we've got this idea is this helps us know the context here that Jesus is teaching his disciples a lesson and this parable is contained within it. A lesson for how to be persistent towards the end times as we await his return. And that's us, isn't it? But believe it or not, this is one of those verses that applies more to us than it did to the people that followed him 2,000 years ago. Uh, and I hope that that's really clear. That, so I want to review some of what those teachings were and some of those lessons because today's lesson fits in there. One of the first lessons that he was trying to teach in the coming of the Son of Man was that it's perfectly natural to long for those days. That's what he said. He says, look, you're going to long to see the days of the Son of Man. That's, that's natural. And, and, you know, we talked about this a little bit last week. Studying prophecy brings a blessing to us. And I guess maybe the best way to summarize it is it's nice to know we win, right? I, I, I just uh, a story about a baseball game a long time ago that I had a DVR and I had recorded the baseball on the DVR. By the way, the DVR is one of the proofs of God as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it, it rec just pause right in the middle of whatever, watch it when you want. And, and I got a text from a guy saying, you're not going to believe it, it's extra innings. Well, I was, I was hours behind when I saw the text. And it didn't look like it was going to be extra innings at the time. It was nice to know, kind of, when we read the book of Revelation, it promises a, a blessing to us. And one of those blessings is our team wins. Whatever suffering, whatever injustice we're enduring now, the good guys win in the end. All right? And that's one of the blessings. So it's perfectly natural to long for and study and want those days. But don't get caught up in making predictions. Okay, no one knows when that's going to happen. Really, no, and that's, that's repeated many times in Scripture, not just a couple of times that we've heard about it. Uh, so it, as a matter of fact, not only will no one know, it will come as a shock because it will be business as usual right up until that. Right? We heard that in some of these. Right up until the, 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 just like when the days of Noah and the days of Lot, people were doing all this stuff. It was business as usual. Another thought was that you're not going to miss this. Jesus' return will be obvious. And the reason I think he was pointing that out is the disciples of that time actually thought they might miss it. Like, 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 like we have to study the stars like the Magi did and make sure they had careful calculations. He's like, no, it's, it's not going to work like that. As, there's a, a, a section in Thessalonians where Paul explains to them, I know someone has told you that you've missed the second coming. I assure you that's not true. And Jesus is saying the same thing. You're not going to miss this. There's no way you're going to... You can't know when, and you can't know where. But it's when it happens, you'll know. Okay? And then the lessons became a little bit more uh, applicable to how we live our lives. And we talked about it. One was don't turn back. Right? It was remember Lot's wife. See, you're a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone. And he's saying, look, you try to cling to the old, that's going to be a problem. And, and, and he put it this way. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. Insert the word old in there. And you'll, it'll make, whoever tries to keep his old life will lose it because you're a new creation now. And, and if, if you want to lose your old life, that's how you preserve it. And then we ended last week with our study that's, you got work to do, okay? Right? There's, there's, you know, it's great to study this, it's encouraging for you, but come on now, let's get busy. You got, you got a job here. And, and I, I think we used uh, 
this verse in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10 to summarize this. It's beautiful theology. Verses 8 and 9 say these works, works cannot save you. You are saved by the grace of God, not by works. But, verse 10 says, there are works after you're saved for you to do. That only makes sense, doesn't it? This is a king. We're in a kingdom. We're servants. You've got assigned tasks. I don't know if you realize that or not. So, oh, there's a little bit of a reminder there. Hey, let's get busy, right? There's, there's chores that you're doing that you're supposed to be doing here, as it were. And that's part of this. Today's message, always pray and don't give up. This is the final one in this son of man sandwich section that we've been dealing with. And this, remember I told you this is a real easy lesson to figure out what it means, but it's hard to apply. Do you know how I could be so confident that I know what this means? I mean, that would be, that would be real arrogance. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what the Bible says. Well, verse 1, Luke 18, verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Now, I, I don't mean to be sarcastic about that, but uh, you really don't need a degree to figure that out when Luke tells you. The purpose of this parable is to teach us, always pray, don't give up. And that's beautiful, isn't it? But, but it's hard to do. At least, can I confess that it is for me? I've told you before that I'm a patient in the same hospital, a, a person steeped in sin, recovering by the grace of Jesus Christ. Not only am I a patient in the same hospital, this is my floor right here. My ward here are people who care for those of us that are, give up on prayer too easily. I, I'm there. And, and, you know, the idea of not giving up, well, you know, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a procrastinator. Right? John Paul Jones, the, the, the father of the American Navy, said, I've not yet begun to fight. I have a t-shirt that my daughter uh, gave me, uh, I've not yet begun to procrastinate, okay? <laughs> I'll put that off, I'll put off putting things off till later. That's how complicated I am. So, so this is, my, my, my grandfather from Iowa told me a story one time. He says, son, farming is simple but hard. And I think I was about five years old when he told me that. And it's taken me a lifetime to figure out what he meant. And that is, there are some things like this parable that I can explain easily and we can understand. But really applying them requires more nobility of character than sometimes I've got. Okay? But I'd love to take you through this, and maybe through Jesus' illustration of this, we can learn some things and some insights. So let's do that. Let's see how he illustrated this in this parable. It begins in verse 2. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. You know, Jesus has this amazing way of very succinctly and quickly painting a picture of extremes. Right? By the way, in, in every town, maybe not every town, but they would... They, they, you know, they had priests and rabbis, and they held a lot of sway philosophically with people. But, you know, if someone stole a sheep from you, the rabbi could condemn the theft, but he didn't have a lot of muscle to go back and actually recover it for you. See, sometimes you needed the force of law. And in the first century Palestine, everything was occupied by the Romans. So the Romans had magistrates or judges that had territories, and this is who you would appeal to because that magistrate or that judge could send a couple of Roman soldiers to compel someone to do what was right. Does that make sense? And this is a judge that's been appointed over that. But uh, the, the, it says he neither feared God nor cared about men. I'm struggling. I've been struggling all week to think if there's a worse description of a human being that could be made than those two things. He doesn't care about God. Imagine that. Right? I mean, clearly, does that mean he doesn't believe or just flaunts it in the face of God? I don't know what's worse. And doesn't care about people. You know, what's left? What's left? If you do not concern yourself with the thoughts of God nor the thoughts of other people, then this is a complete narcissism here. He's only worried about himself in here, right? And that's, that's kind of funny to me. So Jesus is painting very quickly this picture. In this corner, a judge who neither fears God nor cares about men. In this corner, verse 3, a widow. The symbol of helplessness, especially in that culture. 
A widow in that town kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. You know, in the first century, and it didn't matter whether it was Palestine, whether it was Jerusalem, everywhere. To be a woman was slightly above being property at that point. I'm sorry, ladies. This is a historical truth. And it was everywhere then. And by the way, it still is that bad in some places of the world. This widow now has no advocates, no family. She's, she has no voice in society. If she were granted a hearing in a court case, her testimony could be easily disputed simply because she's a woman, and in many courts she would not even be allowed to testify because she's a woman. So you understand the deal there. Now, we don't know what her deal is. All we are told is that she's pleading for justice, and she's appealing to the judge or the magistrate, which means it must be something that person can resolve. And, you know, I think, I think Jesus doesn't tell us what the case is on purpose because he wants us to focus on her persistence, not her case. But it helped me to imagine. So I hope you'll forgive me here. I'm going to engage in a little sanctified imagination. I'm, I'm going to I've come up with a hypothetical that fits this scenario that kind of helped me realize why, why she was doing this. So suppose this lady and her husband had a, a herd of some sheep and some goats, maybe 20 of them. And they, they used the milk from the goats, they, the meat from time to time, but then they also would shear the animals and she would spin the wool into thread and make garments. Okay? That's what they did. Well, a husband dies. Remember the life expectancy of that era? It was less than 40. It's probably around the early 30s. Uh, and and I, I just if you a careful study, remember George Washington, the first president of the United States, died of strep throat. Okay, so I just want to make sure you understand we live in a wonderful medical age, despite what we sometimes think of doctors. Right? We live in a wonderful medical age. Well, back then, uh, people died of of simple dysentery and things like that. So her husband dies. She's left with this herd of goats. She can't take care of these goats and do this spinning. So she decides she's going to sell the herd to somebody. She's going to use the money to buy just the wool and continue her business, and she can exist that way. She sells. She agrees to a fair price. The guy takes the herd and doesn't pay her. See, And when challenged, he says, oh, I already paid her husband. I don't know what he did with the money. So it's a shame he's dead now because now I've already paid for it. So I, does that make sense? All right, now, the reason I'm painting that is I want to get your blood up a little bit. This is unjust. This is, we can be righteously indignant at this act, can we not? And that's what we need to, because when she makes that plea for justice from her adversary, something wrong has been done here. Someone has just stolen from her and taken advantage of her because of her position in society, and she's making that plea. But see, Jesus also points out maybe more than that, that she kept coming to him. You see that? That's the thing. She kept coming. The highlight here is not what her case was. The one I've uh, allowed maybe gets us to think about it and allows us to engage our emotions, but she kept coming. Oh, so let's see what happens. Verses 4 and 5. For some time he refused, talking about the judge. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I do not fear God or care about men, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. So <laughs> her persistence. You know, I learned this as a supervisor a long time ago. If you nag people long enough, work actually becomes the course of least resistance. <laughs> I, d please don't write that down. I think there's better motivational techniques than that. But, but it is true, is it not? And this is what happens is she finally just wears him out. But it is interesting that Jesus takes us through his logic. There's a, there's a clue here. In a lot of parables, when Jesus is trying to show someone's faulty thinking, they say to themselves. See, because we're to, we're to derive wisdom from God. And godly people can give us input. And with wisdom and many counselors, there's victory, right? If you are just advising yourself and you are your own advisor, you got a problem, right? Lincoln said... Uh, a man who is his own lawyer has a fool for a client. 
Right? This guy has only got his own perspective to advise himself. So that's a clue in parables to somebody that's just really horribly wrong. So he says to himself, it's funny, he even admits, well, I don't fear God and I don't care about men. Right? He, he's proud of that fact. I, I'm not worried about an eternal justice here. I don't care what people think about me. This is about my own personal convenience. I want this lady to leave me alone. So I'm going to give her what she wants because that will give me peace. And that's it. And then Jesus in verse 6 contrasts that. It's really important here that we, we use the word contrast rather than comparison because in no way is he implying that God is like that. He's implying that God is so other than that. But he's also pointing out that even this evil man finally relented. Verse 6 he said, And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. In other words, listen to the lesson from what happened with this guy. Verse 7. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? If this immoral man, the unethical, can be persuaded by sheer persuasion, by just nagging, how much more do you think an infinitely loving and infinitely just God would want to bring about justice on behalf of children that he loves? And that's the point. And if this lady got what she wanted by having to nag, can you imagine how much God would give to her, right? I mean, think about this. And one of the reasons I told you this hypothetically, if you were the judge in that city and it was within your power, when you knew this case, if it was within your power to fix it, send two Roman soldiers, make the guy pay, wouldn't you? Of course you would. And this is the point. If you and I would remedy this situation if it was within our power to do so, don't you think God will as well? And don't you think he wants to? I think that's part of what we need to remember. We're fallen people. We have Our sense of justice is, is warped because of our fallen minds. And yet if we can recognize injustice, don't you think the perfect being who is infinitely just can recognize it as well? Matthew says this really well. Remember, the lesson was always pray, never give up. Listen to how Matthew teaches this lesson beginning in verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Right? Always pray. But he goes on in verse 9. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? You know, it's not often I can be encouraged and called evil at the same time. And I am in this verse. And this is the way we're to think of it. How much more? The argument from lesser to the greater. We don't really know the heart of God, but it must be superior to our own. And if we see a problem, don't you think he does? Don't you think that what's going on around the world saddens him as well, and he is motivated to do something about it? And this is one of those things, as I mentioned earlier, I think this is easier for me to understand and intellectually agree with than it is sometimes to apply and I've talked to some of you who've been kind enough to share that you struggle with this too. So I'm glad. And there are people <laughs> among us in our body, the people especially that are people that are on our prayer team, that have amazing daily habits of going before the throne and pleading. In some cases, your prayer requests on your behalf to God. It's a daily habit that they've developed. And, and, and I'm envious of them. I'm glad they're in this body to teach me that as well. But for me and some of the rest of you that I know struggle with this, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask you to help me with a little bit of an exercise, okay? Uh, in order to strengthen this muscle that Jesus wants us to have, to always pray and not give up, I'd like us to do an exercise together. Would you do that for me, okay? And what I want you to do is I want you to think of a request that you want to make to God right now. 
And it could be like this parable. It could be something that is an injustice. Maybe something has been done wrong to you. Maybe you've been overlooked by, some, by a, a, a promotion. Maybe something's been stolen from you. Uh, perhaps it's something that's happened to a close friend or a loved one. You know, when illnesses strike children, that, that is it's just, we know that is unjust. Can't we now come up with something? Can you think of something? And maybe it doesn't have to be an injustice. You know, maybe something's already entered into your mind, and I don't want to talk you out of it. That's what you should petition the Lord for. But to give you some ideas, maybe you are looking for an opportunity to serve. Maybe you're trying to figure out what is, what are my chores that you want me to do for this kingdom? Or maybe, maybe you're struggling to grow closer in your relationship with him. Those are all wonderful things to ask for. My only request is make it personal and make it memorable. Because as a group, I want this exercise to be an exercise in persistent prayer. Pray without ceasing. So I'm going to ask you, in a moment, we want to pray together, silently, for each of our individual requests. And I'd like to ask you to do it every day this week. Okay? And I'll remind you next week to pray continuously without ceasing, to always pray and never give up, okay? I hope that's something that you can do. I hope you've got something in your mind that you would be ready to pray for. Before we do, I'd like to kind of show you a couple of pictures because I think part of the reason that Jesus taught us this parable was to show us the contrast between the way we might think of God and the way God really is. You know, the picture of the unjust judge, the, the, the Swiss artist, you know, I confess that's sometimes how I see God, sitting on the throne in white, aloof, a little bit unapproachable, like the CEO of the universe, and I don't want to bother him, okay? Any of you see God that way? I'd like to show you another picture now. This is, uh, I know some of you are way too young to know that this is John Fitzgerald Kennedy. He was president of the United States in the early 1960s. I believe this photograph was taken in 1962. Then and now, this is the most powerful office in the world. It, it, the leader of the free world is the person who sits at this desk as the president of the United States. And just as a quick commentary, that person deserves our respect regardless of what we think of them. And we pray for them regardless of whether they are in our political party or not, okay? And I did that, and I have done that, regardless of whether I voted that for that person or not. But this is a powerful person. If I have my request, and I tried to make it to this person here, can you fix this problem for me? I could never get in. I'd be stopped at the gate. <laughs> if I got past the gate, I'd be stopped a few yards beyond the gate. If I got to the house, to the structure, I couldn't physically get in. If I barged my way in, you realize all the concentric circles of security that protect that person from you or I walking up and making our request to them. Okay? But now look again. There's a little boy playing under the desk of the most powerful person in the free world. That's John F. Kennedy Jr., John John. His tragic death was just that. It was tragic. But it's interesting. Not only does he seem to have access to ask for the same kinds of things that I would want to ask for, but he actually gets to play at the feet of the most powerful person in the free world. And do you know why? Well, it's not because of anything he's done. It's not because he crawled on his knees across rocks. It's not because he's been to seminary. It's not because he did or promised to do anything. It's because of his relationship with this person. See, that's his dad, right? And that's why Jesus encouraged us to do something absolutely radical in that day and now. And that is to call the all-being master of time, space, and dimension who breathed and spoke the universe into existence, Dad, Abba, Father, do you realize that because of the work of Jesus Christ, you and I have that kind of access to the most powerful being in the universe? 
Do you think of God that way when you pray? I'd like you to. I'd like you to. I'll tell you something. Just Maybe you can learn from my own struggles with this. See, God is holy and so powerful, and I'm aware of that. And I am so stained with sin. I feel like I've showed up to a wedding in jogging clothes, and I stink. And I'm scared to come into his presence. I don't feel I'm worthy to do that all the time. But I'm clothed in Christ's righteousness because of his work. And, And the Bible tells me on the authority of the word of God that my faith in Jesus as the son of God and the son of man allows me to approach the king of the universe as a child. And because of the Holy Spirit living inside of me, I can speak to him anytime and anywhere. Where can I go from your love? And this is the kind of access. I hope this image has helped, will help you as much as it has helped me. So we're going to leave it up. And I want to take just a few seconds. And I want to ask each of you, you, know, you don't, if it would help you to write this down and maybe share it with someone, that's fine. But you don't have to. Except with God. It's the only person. And so... Let's take, as we close our time together, let's take just a few seconds and let's always pray and not give up and make our petition to the God of the universe that loves us like we're his children. Let's pray together. Please do this every day, and then we'll remind each other, and we'll help each other. No guilt. Encouragement to help each other, to always pray and never give up. We'll do that next week as well. Let me close our service now uh, as we continue with our worship with the, with the, the team singing and then our communion. Father, how grateful we are that you have adopted us as your children only because we are saved by your grace, and we are, and we're so thankful for that. And, and, but, Father, I would ask, please, help us. Uh, draw us to yourselves so that we can build this relationship with you like, like the loving Father that we see in this picture, that we could become absolutely confident and certain of the closeness of your love for us, the closeness of your love like the indwelling Holy Spirit that is always inside of us, Remind us, Father, the power of your love, the same power that carves the mountains and the canyons and fills the seas and has created every star in the sky and knows them by name. That is the power of your love for us. And and also, Father, remind us now as we remember the sacrifice of your son, the depth of your love for each of us because of the sacrifice that he made on our behalf, the Son of Man that there is no greater love than this. And we accept it on our behalf in his name. Amen.